Hello everyone and welcome back to Bomb Chew. I'm Chris. I'm Austin. And today we're taking a look at the Humble Choice Bundle for January of 2021. Well, the nightmare and decades-long year of 2020 is finally in the rearview mirror, and we're on to hopefully better things for 2021. Things in the outside world still aren't in the best place, but let's try to look on the bright side of life in this coming new year. Humble's here once again with a bundle of games, so let's take a look and see if we can get this year off to a good start. This month's Humble Original is Hey Park Boy. You play as you boy a tiny alien who crash lands in a rundown park. Your ship runs off of happiness, so to get home, you'll have to restore the park to fill the area with happiness to fuel your ship. You have a water gun, which you can use to water seeds to turn them into flowers, and once they're grown, you can play music for them to make them dance until they fill with color and send more seeds out. Once you grow enough flowers in an area, the ground will turn green, making flowers continue to grow there on their own, and fertilizing the surrounding areas so you can grow flowers in more places. Once you've grown enough flowers, you'll start to earn upgrades that allow you to travel to the city, clean up trash, and more. It's a feel-good game inspired by the likes of Chibi Robo and Katamari, and it has a lot more to do than I expected at first glance. The core gameplay is just a bit too tedious for me to want to really keep going, but it has a lovely vibe and some great music. Water runs out a little too quickly, with faucets being a bit too spread out, and playing music to spread seeds takes a bit too long. And worse, some flowers don't always pick up your music immediately, so you have to play even longer. There are potentially upgrades that you can earn to make the game a bit easier, but it takes what I think is a lot longer than it should to earn your first upgrade. I think some minor tweaks could make this a great experience, and I would love to see it get an update. Either way, I recommend at least trying it out, and definitely go check out the music, which is up on SoundCloud. The Ambassador Fractured Timelines is a twin-stick fantasy shooter with a time manipulation mechanic thrown in. You are a battle mage with a melee weapon and a staff for casting magic. I say melee, you really just throw it and it comes back to you like a boomerang. Magic consumes mana to shoot a projectile, but mana regenerates slowly over time. I found myself using mana until I ran out, and then using my weapon for a bit to regenerate. Your weapon can attack quickly if you land hits and you're close to your opponent, but until it returns to your hand you won't be able to attack again, so misses are punishing. Your weapon also won't hit enemies on the way back, which I found a bit disappointing. If you switch to magic while your weapon is on its way back to you, it will drop to the floor until you switch off of magic again, and then it will slowly fly back to you from wherever you dropped it, which can take a significant amount of time, and again, not hitting enemies on the way. Each level you must kill all the enemies to activate the portal to the next level, which will fully heal you and restore all mana. Die and you'll have to start the level over again, unless you're on the easier difficulty. As far as I got, levels didn't seem too hard, especially once I remembered to utilize my time freeze. Holding down a button will freeze time around you, allowing you to avoid damage and get some extra attacks of your own off. Along the way, you'll find new equipment that will change up how your attacks work, or passive changes like regening mana faster or improving defense at the cost of mobility. What I played worked well, and it wasn't boring, but it did feel a bit shallow. Bosses and many bosses are fun, but regular enemies just get a bit dull after a while. And at least in what I've played, it's mostly level after level of just regular enemies. I wouldn't call this game a reason to buy the bundle, but if you're already getting the bundle anyway, this one is, at the very least, decent fun to try out. D-Leveled is a puzzle platformer developed by Toaster Fuel and released in September of 2020. D-Leveled tasks players with guiding two cubes through a mirrored level in order to hit a series of switches to reach the end goals and move on to the next stage. Each stage has various traps and obstacles to try to navigate through, including carefully timed platforming sections, spikes, one-way walls, and more increasingly difficult obstacles as you advance through the stages. The main mechanic revolves around you controlling each cube at the same time, with the same movements, as well as their ability to bounce each other up and down as they collide along the dividing line between them. While the movements between the two cubes are mirrored, their environments are not. This quickly expands on the skill set you're required to develop in order to solve the puzzles of each stage. Hitting each of the switches in order to activate the exit will require you to know when to keep your cubes bouncing simultaneously, when to keep them bouncing one at a time, and when to use a well-placed wall or other obstacle to get them separated, as well as needing you to figure out how to do all these things using what you're given in each stage. Completing a stage with zero deaths or resets gives you a star, which can be used to unlock an additional level in each world. Completing this star level will unlock a final bonus stage for each world. There are 10 worlds in total, with 12 stages each, including the bonus stages. 
Visually, the game is simple but charming enough, which is all it really needs to be for this type of puzzle game. The chiptune soundtrack is very catchy, offering a variety of NES-style music loops that serve as good background noise, while you strain your brain trying to figure out how to hit that last set of switches. D-Leveled is a very stripped-down and streamlined puzzle experience. The focus is on the puzzle gimmick, and everything else is there to keep you focused on this element. Luckily, the gimmick of this puzzle game is really clever and fun to play around with. The puzzles get tough pretty quickly, and often I found myself feeling like I was way too dumb to even attempt completing the stage. However, the trial and nature era of the game's quick restarts made jumping straight in and workshopping solutions a lot of fun. When you do manage to complete a stage, or even when a single element or obstacle finally clicks, the feeling of satisfaction is pretty great, and served as great motivation for me to keep going. While I have a feeling that the later stages are going to be far beyond my comprehension, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited to see just how far I can get. I wasn't expecting much out of D-Leveled, as puzzle games tend to make me feel dumb and get frustrated, but I ended up having a lot of fun. The mechanics are simple but unique, and it's such a tightly crafted and streamlined experience that I think everyone should definitely check it out. Minoria is a side-scrolling action-adventure game and spiritual successor to Momodora. While coming from the same developer and sharing some themes and other similarities with Momodora, this game is set in its own new universe, so don't worry if you haven't played any of the Momodora games before this. You play as a nun, and the church has decreed that all witches must burn, so you're out to burn you some witches. You'll be platforming, you'll be fighting, and sometimes you'll be doing both at the same time. You can jump, slash with your weapon, dodge, and parry attacks, which allows you to do a ton of damage in a wide area. You'll also get to equip different types of incense, which each do different things. For example, you start off with green incense, which you can use to heal yourself with limited charges between save points. This is considered an active incense, with others like white incense, which allow you to shoot projectiles. There's also passive incense, like one I picked up that regenerates health whenever I kill an enemy. I beat the heck out of Momodora Reverie Under the Moonlight and thought I was pretty good at it by the end, but Minoria has kind of kicked my butt hard so far whenever I haven't been paying close attention, quickly reminding me to seek out save points and to not try to go balls to the wall on enemies that you can't kill before they get an attack off. I think it lacks some of the charm of Momodora, but I'm still having a great time so far and I'm looking forward to playing more. Tales of the Neon Sea is a 2D cyberpunk adventure game. No, not that cyberpunk, you know what I'm talking about. This is an adventure game where you'll be exploring to find stuff you need to solve puzzles. The game starts off without messing around. It's been a long time since I died this shortly into starting a game. You'll make your escape from whatever's chasing you, and the puzzles begin. You need to repair your wrist and ankle. You'll get some help from a friendly cat named William, and hey, you even get to play as William from time to time. Once you solve a few puzzles and make your repairs, we flash back to the past so we can see what led up to Rex getting thrashed and chased down into the sewers. You run a scan on your robot buddy, BBX, and he needs some repairs as well. So guess what? We're gonna do more puzzles. As far as I can tell, this game involves a lot of puzzles, so it's a good thing that they're pretty varied and fun. They also aren't dumb, and whenever you need to go find something, you'll either start with a pretty good idea of where to look, or the game will go out of its way to present it to you. The pixel art is really lovely, especially when you make it out into the city. There's just so much lovely scenery to look at, aside from the obvious, uh, womanly posters and signage. This one isn't action-packed, but it is one I'm looking forward to coming back to. Vampire the Masquerade Shadows of New York is a visual novel developed by Draw Distance and released in September of 2020. Shadows of New York serves as a sequel to Coteries of New York, which was included in this most recent September bundle. Shadows of New York places you in the shoes of a woman named Julia Sawinski, an investigative journalist who seems pretty fed up with just about everything around her, including herself. Wait, a writer with emotional issues that thinks they're a bad writer and is also a self-loathing hipster who thinks the world has gone to hell? I'm not going to be able to connect with this character at all. <laughs> Soon, much like the previous game, they're turned into a vampire and their world is turned upside down. Other than the story, the game is almost exactly the same as the previous, at least mechanically, so excuse me while I whip out my old script. Gameplay is what you'd expect from a visual novel, so at its core there's a lot of reading with the occasional dialogue option. I was actually pleasantly surprised at the amount of dialogue options I've seen so far in the game, with some having actual real consequences. At one point a few minutes in, I decided to go for a bold option in a dire circumstance, and it actually got me killed and led to a game over. 
Playing through the intro a second time does show that most of the dialogue options are more about the flavor of the text rather than drastically different outcomes, but there's still a bigger variety and more impactful decisions than the standard visual novel. While none of the gameplay elements by themselves seem like they'd be all that impactful in the story or experience, it's all the little touches and nuances working together that really help to elevate the story and the experience as a whole. Okay, script recycling time is done. While the story is the main difference between the games, Shadows of New York also has less variety when it comes to the main character. Instead of choosing between a few character and vampire types, you're set with Julia the Shadow Vampire as your only option. While having fewer options does make the game feel less personal, Julia already feels like a much better written protagonist than my character from Coteries of New York did, and I think this is a change for the better. Shadows of New York is more of the same, but not necessarily in a bad way. The writing is still solid, the visuals are very stylized and help set the mood of every scene very well, and I still love the goofy but classy charm of the world of Vampire the Masquerade. If you like Coteries of New York from the September bundle, or you're a fan of the setting or genre, you'll definitely want to check out Shadows of New York. Not Tonight is a Papers, Please style game where you play as a bouncer instead of an immigration inspector. Check IDs and make sure no one underage is getting into the bar. Of course, things get more complicated as you have to start checking for expired IDs, signs of fake IDs, keep certain people out who have caused trouble for the bar owner before, and more. Each night, the bar owner will expect a minimum number of people to be let in for you to get paid, with bonuses for getting more people in than expected, so you'll have to keep the line moving quickly. Your character is a European fighting to try and stay in the UK, and to do so, you'll have to make a certain amount per month. However, as a non-citizen, you can't get paid very well, so you'll have to decide if it's worth messing up a bit at your job when people offer you bribes to get in when they're underage or have something else wrong with their ID. Not Tonight started off a lot like Papers, Please without the super depressing atmosphere, especially with the bouncy music coming out of the club whenever you let someone inside. Seriously, I have to find this soundtrack. However, the tone shifts pretty hard when you're off work, living in the crap hole of Relocation Block B, and being treated like trash who should be grateful for the terrible paying job you're forced into. Somehow between the bouncy clubs and the depressing home life, the game manages to also be quite funny in a lot of moments, including a few that made me laugh out loud very hard. I'm a big fan of Not Tonight, and if you like indie games at all, I recommend you give it a try. Song of Horror is a third-person episodic horror game with fixed camera angles. You can pick from four characters with different stats to explore a house and try to find its owner, who has disappeared. Each character has a different relationship and reason for wanting to find the owner, and they also have different reactions to the objects you can interact with inside the house. They also each have a different type of light source and useful item that makes them unique. I picked the guy with the flask, but sadly I could not find a way to drink from it. No matter who you pick, your light source won't run out, so you don't have to find fuel or batteries. However, darkness is really more of an annoyance than something to fear. For the first chunk of the game, I found myself just very lost at where I was until I was finally given a map, and even then, I found myself having to check it frequently. You'll be spending most of this game solving puzzles, and unlike Tales of the Neon Sea, you'll be having to look all over the place in the dark for what you need to solve these puzzles. And even when you have what you need, the puzzles I found weren't very satisfying to solve. This fuse box, for example. Ha ha ha! All the wires on the left look the same. Which boxes on the right match up? Figure it out! Ha ha ha! And yeah, it figures an old house is going to have crappy unmarked wires, but that's an annoying enough problem in real life. A dark entity is roaming the house, apparently controlled by an AI to change how it behaves in response to you, but it seems that if you listen to doors before entering them to make sure the coast is clear, you can avoid encounters. Enter a room with an encounter, you'll need to complete a quick time event in order to survive. If you die though, not to worry. I mean, that character is now dead, but you can return as one of the remaining characters. I haven't died yet, and I don't care to find out what happens if you run out of living characters, but what I have played so far hasn't been scary or fun. Walking is slow, exploring is tedious, puzzles are unsatisfying, the opening of the story had me falling asleep, and so far I've gotten tons of warning when the monster is nearby to help avoid it. Still, it has quite a few positive reviews on Steam. If this looks like the right kind of scary to you, and you don't like having to deal with skill and resource-based combat and action-based survival horror games, then you might have a good time here. But this one just wasn't my cup of tea. Total Tank Simulator is a military battle simulation game from developer Noobs from Poland and released in May of 2020. 
Total Tank Simulator has you watching and controlling battles taking place in varied locations and with different objectives, depending on the mode. Campaign has you pick a nation, and then lead them through a variety of different battle scenarios, and allows you to upgrade your troops, generals, and available technology in between battles. There's also Shadow Mode, which pits you against your own army from the previous round, and continuing to fight your own winning army until you eventually create an unbeatable foe. The game also has workshop support, in the form of custom crafted scenarios for you to try your hand at completing, as well as a sandbox mode for you to fool around in and just unwind. During combat, you can either watch the battle unfold from above, or you can take control of individual units on the ground. Controls on the ground are fairly simple, somewhat to the game's detriment, as it isn't all that satisfying to play as any of the units, and serves mostly as a way to pass the time while the AI takes care of things. Total Tank Simulator looks and feels like a more militaristic take on something like Totally Accurate Battle Simulator, and is simplistic but charming to look at. Information is presented in a fairly straightforward manner, and the bright colors indicating what side everyone is on helps to keep things clear in the heat of battle. While there's a lot to like about Total Tank Simulator on the surface level, that's really all there is, surface level enjoyment. Deploying units and strategizing your approach to the given scenario gives you a feeling of control, but because there's a strong random element to each battle due to the reliance on AI, that depth of strategy quickly fades away. Controlling a tank or an airplane is fun for a moment, but everything about it feels too cartoony with no real weight or impact to the shots. I think the most fun I had was trying to zero in shots with artillery units, and even that gets boring fairly quickly. I really wanted to like Total Tank Simulator, and for about 10 minutes I did. However, the shallow and boring gameplay left me feeling like I was playing a demake of Battlefield with only AI players, and it's hard for me to think of anyone I would recommend that experience to. Warhammer Chaos Bane is Warhammer's take on the ARPG genre. Diablo, Torchlight, Grim Dawn. If you played any of these, Chaos Bane will feel extremely familiar to you. Isometric camera, click to move and attack, level up to learn and upgrade skills, and look for loot. There's nothing that stands out about this game at all. Like, nothing. It's super easy, you can play it pretty mindlessly, everything it copies it does well, and there's nothing broken about the game or the interface. But it's something other games in the genre have done better, and there are so many better options to play out there. Chaos Bane is simply unremarkable, but if you like ARPGs and you're into Warhammer, rejoice, this game doesn't suck, and dare I say it, it's quite fine. But if you're looking for your next deep ARPG experience, maybe look elsewhere. Pathologic 2 is an open-world survival horror game from developer Icepick Lodge and released in May of 2019. Players take control of Artemy Barak, some kind of doctor in a very strange and bleak world suffering from an outbreak of a pandemic. Gee, this is already hitting a little too close to home. The story begins seemingly at the end of the actual story, with most of the townspeople dead and some general ready to clear the place out, despite your protests. Then you start teleporting around from place to place and from time to time, as the narrative jumps around all over the place in an attempt to tell the backstory of who you are, as well as establish the world you're in. Spoiler alert, it doesn't work, and I hate it. The world and setting seems interesting from a passing glance, but I'm given no points of reference as to where or even when I'm supposed to be, what the rules of this place are, or just what kind of game this is even supposed to be. After the narrative seems to pull its head out of its own ass, and we get through one or two very bare-bones tutorials, we finally get to some real gameplay. And it's a survival game, complete with hunger, thirst, and other meters to manage. Look, I'm keeping this short because I had to force myself to keep playing this game for as long as I did, which I know isn't super fair to the game, but I just hate this. The setting and world seem mildly interesting, but the fractured nature of the plot and the way it's presented, combined with one of my most hated genres of game, works together to make the perfect storm of a game that is the very definition of not for me. If you're into survival games, or the scattered narrative and admittedly interesting setting can hook you in, I'm sure you'll enjoy Pathologic 2. But for me, I couldn't uninstall this one fast enough. Ancestors The Humankind Odyssey is a survival game from developer Panache Digital Games and released in August of 2019. Are you serious? Another survival game? Curse you, Austin, for tricking me into taking two survival games in the same month! I'll get you back for this someday. Alright, setting aside my growth into a supervillain and my bias against survival games, Let's see what we've got here. Ancestors places you in the control of a clan of apes around 10 million years ago in Africa. After a little Circle of Life intro, you're playing as an ape and are tasked with surviving and evolving. Given the genre as well as the subject matter, there's really not much of a story going on here. It's survival in the most primal sense of the word. 
You'll need to find and discover food, explore your surroundings, mate with other apes, and strengthen your lineage. Visually, the game looks very impressive. The jungle is dense but beautiful looking, and some of the vistas you can look over look amazing. Gameplay is kind of nebulous by design. You have basic senses like hearing and smell at your disposal, as well as a generalized survival sense. Focusing on any of your senses while standing still allows you to hone in on things nearby. This can help you identify what they are, as well as memorize them to pinpoint their location to try and find the source. As you do different things, your brain starts to grow, connecting synapses and unlocking new abilities. You start out as basic as possible, being able to grab stuff and eat it, and not much else. As you start to identify things and how they can be used, your options begin to expand. I eventually developed enough motor skills to be able to hold stuff in either hand, allowing me to smash two things together and do stuff like crack open a hard-shelled fruit to get at the good stuff inside. Whenever you lay down in a safe area, you'll be able to evolve your abilities via sort of skill tree. This allows you to firmly establish skills you've been developing as you play, unlocking more abilities and more routes for growth. It's a very neat system, but it can be kind of frustrating at times, especially early on. The game doesn't offer much in the way of hints or real direction, even with all the tutorials and HUD information turned on. You really feel like a lost, clueless creature trying to survive in a dangerous world. Honestly, despite setting aside my bias against the genre, I was still primed and ready to hate this game and just move on. However, once I started to figure out a few basic things, I was surprised to find that I was actually sort of having fun. Running around climbing trees and leaping from branch to branch feels great, and learning the basics of survival feels natural and rewarding. The game can feel directionless at times, and you're still stuck with some frustrating survival genre staples, but it's really not bad, even for someone like myself. While I'm not sure that I'll stick with it for long, I'm having a surprising amount of fun just monkeying around in Ancestors the Humankind Odyssey for now, and I definitely recommend fans of the genre to check it out. PC Building Simulator is, what else, a simulation game from developer The Irregular Corporation and released in January of 2019. This game tasks players with doing exactly what the title would suggest, building PCs. Just like most of the other job simulation titles out there, you have a workshop and are given missions to do different mundane tasks related to the job being simulated. You'll be cleaning out PCs, doing virus scans, replacing graphics cards, and all the other things you'd expect to do while working in an average PC repair shop. Moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is exactly like every other job simulator, with you clicking on parts to unscrew and remove components, clicking on components to install them, and screwing them back into place. PC Building Simulator adds in the ability to actually launch and run the PCs you're working on, even loading into the BIOS if need be. Completing jobs rewards you with cash and experience. Eventually you'll level up, unlocking new parts, more workbenches, and other options to expand your PC building experience. Honestly, everything about this game is just incredibly underwhelming for me. Like I stated in my review of Rover Mechanics Simulator, the job simulation genre really isn't for me. Unlike that game, however, which did win me over, PC Building Simulator doesn't have the benefit of an exotic setting and job to keep me interested. I've built every PC I've owned. Well, Actually, my dad did a lot of the work building even my most recent computer, but the actual building process isn't exciting to me in any way. Putting together a PC and getting it running is just a means to an end for me, and that end goal is having a new, smoothly running computer at my disposal. PC Building Simulator doesn't give me that, so I won't be spending any more time with it, but I'm sure that fans of the job simulator genre will have a blast with this one. So overall, how was this bundle? While Hey Park Boy wasn't perfect, it had a lovely theme, and I think it fit very well into the Humble Original slot. This is the first time in a while that I haven't owned a single game from the bundle, so color me impressed. The headliners outside of PC Building Simulator don't really vibe with me, and I've built enough PCs in my life that I haven't been itching all that hard to play a simulation of it, but I'll give it a try at some point. I found a lot of my fun in the more indie half of the games, with Minoria having been on my wishlist for a long time, and I especially loved Not Tonight, which I hadn't heard of before getting this bundle. While I still need more time to go through some of the games that Austin covered, I'd say I'm pleasantly surprised with this month's lineup. Shadows of New York is a nice narrative distraction and a great follow-up to Coteries of New York, and D-Leveled is slowly becoming one of my favorite puzzle experiences. Sure, I had two survival games to deal with, but Ancestors turned out to be a lot of fun, even for a lifelong enemy of the genre like myself. Overall, not bad, Humble. Not bad at all. If you want to know how much each game costs at full price, here's a price breakdown. Hey, a bit of news. We have a new member here at BombChu. 
we'd like you to give a warm welcome to Tyler. He's been hosting our video game club, which you may have seen on the channel. If you haven't, come check it out. Every two weeks, we have a vote in the bomb Chew Discord on a game to play and discuss. We have a discussion live on Twitch, and then put an edited version up on YouTube shortly after. Most recently, we tackled What Remains of Edith Finch. If it sounds fun to you, come check it out, and make your voice heard in the bomb Chew Discord. Finally, we'd like to give a huge thank you to Blake Harms, Michael Slater, and all of our patrons over on Patreon. Your support means the world to us. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you all next time.